and they can tune in. Tonight we're very happy to have back with us good old friend of Books and Books, James Grappando, and his latest work, Gone Again. James Grappando is a New York Times best-selling author of 24 novels, most of which we have right out there at the counter for sale after you buy his main one for tonight. He was a trial lawyer for 12 years before the publication of his first novel in 1994, which was The Pardon, and now serves as counsel for Boys Schiller and Flexner LLP. He lives in South Florida with his wife, three children, two cats, and a golden retriever named Max who has no idea that he's a dog. Please give your warmest Books and Books welcome to Mr. James Grappando. Okay. I'm going to use the microphone, even though we're an intimate group here, so that if anybody's listening in cyberspace, they can actually hear what I'm saying. So um, it's wonderful to be here. I was telling Mitchell before I, I came in that um, this is my 24th novel, and for 24 novels straight, this is the first place I stop, is Books and Books Bookstore. So... Um, <laughs> So it's a great place to launch a book. It's a great place for you to buy a book. Um, and uh, we're very, very lucky to have Mitchell and Books and Books and his entire staff too. Um, because now, now that I, you know, when I go on tour now, there's, I see one more city that has lost its great bookstore, which is a really sad thing. So we have ours um, and we want to hold on to it. So um, Gone Again is off to a, a great start. Um, Olin Cogdill, who I've known for about 20 years, um, uh, reviewed it in this new this week's paper and thought it's my best book ever. So, and she doesn't throw compliments around lightly. So, um, and she literally has read all 24 of my novels. So I feel very proud that she said that, um, and hope you will have the same conclusion. It's been a um, hope I got that right. Yeah, one more. Oh, I hit it backwards. Sorry. We'll get it straight. That's why I'm a writer and not a, I don't work for, you know, so. Okay, um, been a couple, a busy couple of years for me. So since March of 2014, the last Switek novel was Black Horizon. That was number 11 in the series. Uh, then January 2015 came Cain and Abe. Uh, June came Cash Landing. Uh, now Gone Again, and I have a novella coming out in June and just finished the next Jack Switek novel, which will probably be out sometime either late this year or early next year. So, um, but I'm gonna r relax for a while now. I am not, uh, you know, when I first started writing, we can do a little trivia on this. I first started writing in 1988. That's when I decided I was gonna write a novel. And the, um, what sort of, I'd always had a dream of being a writer, it wasn't a plan, but what sort of pushed me over the edge were a couple things. One was the hottest TV show in the country. Who can guess what it was? 1988, hottest television drama going. Nope, <laughs> L.A. Law. L.A. Law was it, okay? Um, and the hottest book in the country was, uh, it became a movie starring, uh, nope. Actually, it was, this is pre The Firm. Uh, it became a movie with Harrison Ford in it, to give you a clue. Um, do you say it? Presumed, Presumed innocent. innocent, yeah. So those were the, so with that kind of going on, I thought either arrogantly or naively, I thought, I can do that, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so I went for it. Um, and uh, that produced, um, actually that produced a massive failure. Spent four years, nights and weekends writing a book that never got published. But I did get an agent out of that who steered me in the direction and said, you know, try again. So I did, and I wrote a book called The Pardon. Um, and The Pardon came out in, uh, uh, unlike the, you know, the monster in a box that was like uh, 275,000 words or something like that, which your average novel is about 90,000 words, by the way. So the thing that I wrote that never got published was this just uh, out of control. So I spent another six months writing another novel under my agent's guidance and um, he sold it in a weekend and it was Jack Switek's debut in The Pardon. Now, um, has anybody read that book here? Yeah, okay, okay, a lot of you have. So you've that, um, you may not know this, but I never intended um, Jack Switek to become a series. Um, I wrote the first novel thinking 
I had wrapped up the story pretty well. It was a father-son conflict. Jack was a, kind of a, uh, an angry and, but ideological young criminal defense lawyer who defended death row inmates. His father was the law and order governor of Florida who signed more death warrants than any governor in Florida history. Uh, and he finally signs a death warrant for a, one of Jack's clients who Jack believes is innocent. So that's the clash. The story resolves itself. And I thought, well, that's great. That, that book is done. Um, and we did, I did five novels after that that were just standalone, one off. And um, then that was right about the time that um, people stopped writing me letters. I started getting emails. Now nobody writes me letters. The only letters I get now are maybe one or two a month that's like from a nursing home with somebody with 92-year-old <laughs> handwriting or something like that, you know. Um, but everything else is email. But back uh, in the late 90s, 2000, I started getting a lot of emails from people saying, whatever happened to Jack? You know, he was 27 years old in that first novel and he had a lot of things ahead of him and really would like to see more of him. So um, my editor and I talked um, and we decided, well, let's bring him back. Let's, let's see what happens. So Jack um, had a past, so I had to be true to the past and Jack's roots were right there. Um, he worked for, um, as uh, a young lawyer out of college, out of law school, he worked for a place, the fictional place called the Freedom Institute, and the Freedom Institute was headed up by a guy named Neil, who was Jack's mentor, and he was what kind of a left, you know, he went to Woodstock, and he was a leftover hippie from the 60s, and, you know, and, and, and very, um, had, had very strong, you know, the picture of Bobby Kennedy up over the fireplace in his office and that sort of thing. So, um, and that's where I, I drove around trying to find a place where it, Okay, if a guy like Neil really existed and Jack went to work with him, where would they? Where would their office be? And I thought it would be like you know some old house next near the courthouse, right? And um, and so I found this house, and I thought that's it. That's like the perfect place. It's um, and it turns out it's a pretty historic house, uh, right near the Miami River, not far from the. The courthouse. The courthouse is right up the river from there. The house is right around there on um, North uh, 595 Northwest Court. Okay, so that's that becomes Jack's place. Um, so then, fast forward, literally uh, 11, 6, 17 years, right? About that, about 2011, we get an invitation. My daughter's a dancer, um, and one of the um, uh, instructors that she got to know very well is a former ballerina with uh, Miami City Ballet. So we get an invitation to her um, Christmas party one year and we show up at this party and um, we're driving and Tiffany's kind of telling me where to go um, and uh, she's saying, oh, it's on, uh, it's on Ninth Court. And I'm like, oh, really? That's interesting. That's, that's where, G that's where uh, Jack's place is. And uh, and then she's like, okay, we'll turn here. And I was like, wow, this looks really, really familiar. So um, it turns out this is their house. This, it's their house, you know? So, uh, and I'm not kidding. So, and I had never been inside the house. Um, and it was really interesting for me to um, get inside the house because it was almost exactly the way I had imagined that it would look with the old Dade County pine floors and... Um, you know the uh, the coral rock walls and the coral and the stone fireplace and so forth. So, so that was pretty pretty fun. So so anyway, so Jack, I ra I say all this because Jack got out of that life, right? If you read the series, you know Jack, he hasn't done a a death penalty case since the pardon, and the book is twelve. The series is twelve ser twelve books long now. So. So I decided it was time to get back to Jack's roots. So Jack, um, I decided he's going to go back to the Freedom Institute, but not as, you know, he's a different place in his life. He doesn't, you know, have that passion to be doing that kind of work. So, uh, so he just goes in there and he's renting space, essentially, keeping the place af afloat by paying too, you know, too much rent uh, there. 
But I decided, okay, I've got to know something about the death penalty work. I, I did, um, my first job out of law school, I did get exposed to a lot, a steady diet of death penalty appeals because I worked for a federal judge in the U.S. Court of Appeals. If you all went to uh, watch any of Scalia's uh, funeral, you remember the scene where it's like all the law clerks are lined up. So anyway, I didn't clerk on the Supreme Court, but was the court right below it, which is the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And it's that same type, it, it gave you probably an insight as to how intimate the relationship can be between the judge and his law clerks. So, um, and we here had a pretty stressful existence uh, because at the time that I was there, um, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit covers Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. And at the time, Florida and Georgia were executing more death row inmates than the other 48 states combined, even Texas. Okay, so, um, so it was, and so we were, you know, when you turn on the news and you see, you know, the court of last resort, you know, the death warrant has been signed, you know, the, you know, the, the delivery man with the US, UPS guy would show up with, you know, and this is back, you know, when files are not digitalized, you know, and there's no, no thumb drives or anything. You've literally had the record on appeal, the trial courts, the appeals, the habeas corpus petitions, and, you know, like 15, you know, banker's boxes would be dumped into the office uh, at 4.30 in the afternoon, and it was like, oh, by the way, the execution is 7.30 tomorrow morning, you know, so, you know, so, uh, you know, and it's like, it it's really freaks you out. So, um, and I was, that's my first job out of law school. So, um, uh, and we had, you know, there was, uh, you're, and you're very insulated, though, because, like, even um, Ted Bundy's appeal, Ted Bundy's, everybody knows who that is, right? Okay, yeah, so, uh, and his appeal came through, but even though you feel, when you're in appellate court, you're sort of, you're insulated from even the media, you know, you didn't notice it until you walk out of the courthouse and you see, you know, there's all these, I don't know why they're there. It's not, it's not like, you know, some judge is going to talk to them or something about the appeal, but, you know, they want to be at the courthouse where this is all happening, so... In any event, um, I, um, I got, I, I'd, I'd been away from it for a while, so I, I did some um, research on it. And the first thing that I came across, which is very interesting, this, the University of Michigan now has this National Registry of Exonerations, and they keep track of all this sort of thing. Um, and I thought this was pretty startling. I was actually shocked to find this out, because I'd been you know, away from it for so long. 58 homicide convictions in one year. There were people on death row for murder that 58 people who had, did, had not committed the crime. Um, and they had, the average person had served 14 and a half years uh, in jail for, some, for a crime they had not committed. So, um, so I thought, well, that's interesting. But I, I didn't know if there was a story in that or not. But Because uh, I'd already written one story, uh, you know, the pardon, in which, you know, Jack thinks his client is innocent and so forth. So I, you can't write the same thing twice. Um, I put this little thing on the bottom here, um, my stand, uh, because you all, somebody's going to ask, I'm sure, you know, where do you stand on the death penalty and all that. One of the things I'm most proud of is that you could read the pardon and you could, you could read Gone Again and you wouldn't know where I stand on the death penalty because I, first of all, I hate preachy books. Um, I hate preachy novels, that's for sure. So, um, you know, I make you think about things, but I don't, I really just hate um, reading a book that seems to have an agenda or point of view, so I don't write them. Um, so I'm not going to tell you, and you won't be probably won't be able to guess is is the answer to that one. Um, so so I know Jack's going back to the Freedom Institute, and I and I'm, I know there's going to have got to have something to do with the death penalty because that's all they do at the Freedom Inst the fictional Freedom Institute. So you got to have a hook, all right? So that's like the first thing I do whenever I'm writing a book is like. Um, because one thing my agent, I had, it's a father-son team who represents me, Artie and Richard. Artie's now passed away. But Artie's approach to things, whenever I told him I have this great idea, and this is back when people actually used to actually talk to each other, you know, <laughs> you know so, so we'd get on the phone, you know, what, what a concept. You know, we would have a conversation instead of just exchanging emails. And um, uh, I would just sort of babble on and babble on and babble on and say, you know what, why don't you just write... Uh, write up three pages of your idea and, you know, and, and send it to me. So I'm like, I send it, and I think, wow, this is great. He's going to love this. And, it, and he would just call me and say, well, why don't you, you know, can you get it to a page? I'm like, wow, how can I get it to a page? But I do, and I go back. I, it takes me a week to cut the three pages down to a page. And he says, you know what I really want is a, is a paragraph. You know, can you just do a paragraph? And I'm like, 
Are you, you're driving me crazy, you know? And, and then he would finally say, you know, this is how I want you to do this. Just, I want one sentence, and I want you to start it with, this is the story of, okay? And I would go back and I would do that, and then I, I knew I didn't have to call him anymore, right? Because then I knew what I was writing about, you know? So um, this isn't exactly one sentence, but so this was the, the hook that I came up with roughly for before I really started diving into Gone Again, is this young girl, Sashi Burgett, who's 17 years old, um, who vanished, 17 years old. I say vanished, that's a key word, because they never found a body, right? So, um, but there was a man convicted of murdering her, and he's, you know, days away from execution. And Jack is at the Freedom Institute, you know, promising his wife, Andy, that he's not going, she's an FBI agent, she doesn't want him to be doing death penalty work. They're about to start a family. He needs to actually be making money, that sort of thing. He promised her he's not going to do death penalty work. But a woman comes to Jack and wants him to stop the execution of this man on death row for a reason that surprises Jack, because she's the victim's mother, and she is convinced that her daughter is still alive and that this man is going to be executed not only for a murder he didn't commit, but for a murder that never happened. Um, so that's the hook. Um, and so ne step two, so that's step one, okay? And then I gotta figure out what's, what's the cast, right? So, um, and one of the great things about having a series is, well, there's actually, it's, it's, it's a, it's a two-edged sword, really, because it's, it's a great thing, but sometimes it's frustrating because your, your, your lead character you know, obviously, if you've got this great idea about a brain surgeon, <laughs> you know, I can't put Jack into that novel, right? You know, it's like, oh, by the way, you know, he's, he studied a lot of science when he was in law school, you know, so, you know, so, uh, so, uh, no. So, so we know that um, Jack's going to be in it, and he's got to be the lead, you know, and he, and um, by the way, so Jack is 27 when the series starts. Now he's in his 40s, so life has moved on. He's married to Andy Henning, who's an FBI agent. Um, she's pregnant in the story. He's starting a family. And uh, if I wrote a Jack Switek novel without Theo Knight, um, the fans of the series would kill me because they like, they've, most people seem to like him the most out of, out of, the, um, out of the cast. He's, Theo is um, uh, a former client of Jack's. He's the only guy who spent time on death row um, uh, that Jack represented that was actually innocent. So Theo spent four years of his life on death row for a crime he didn't commit, and he lives his life the way you'd expect him to, you know, someone who's making up for lost time. So that's what makes him so interesting. So I got that. So then step two is like, okay, people we don't know. Um, uh, and I didn't, I didn't want this to turn into a story really about um, a guy on death row. Okay, so, so I put him first on this list, but it was like quickly I realized, okay, he's dropping to the bottom, all right? This is, that's, this is not his story. Um, I want that have some of that, but not a lot. And then I thought, well, the two interesting people, obviously a woman who walks into a lawyer's office and says she wants to stop the execution of the man who was convicted for murdering her daughter, that's a pretty interesting character, all right? You, you wanna know more about her. So she's up there, but then I started thinking about it more, and I'm thinking, well, that's really, if she's saying, if what she's saying is true, that um, her daughter is still alive, that makes her pretty interesting, right? Because is she just going to stand by and let this guy die by lethal injection for killing her, right? And she knows, <laughs> he didn't do it, obviously. She knows better than anyone else. So I thought, okay, that's, that's the one I'm really most interested in. So, you know, uh, just because of all the questions, right? She's 17 years old, she disappears. The trial goes on, uh, a man is convicted, and now he's about to be executed. Is, is she dead? Is she pretending to be dead? Where is she? Who is she? Um, and really, what does her mother know? Why is her mother all of a sudden coming forward now on the eve of execution to say, okay, she's still alive, 
uh, you know. Um, and by the way, you know, the police don't believe her because they think it's a hoax. They think someone's, you know, some, some guy is uh, feeding her information that she, um, you know, preying on a grieving mother, basically, is what the police conclude. So um, it's deeper than that, but you'll have to read it to figure it out. So, so I'm figuring out what's this relationship between the mother and the daughter. Maybe the mother doesn't really know her daughter this well. So then I go to my research file. Okay, so now I've got, which is why whenever somebody comes to me and says, um, oh, I got this great idea for a book, you know, and uh, all you got to do is write it, you know, and, you know, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I know that they've never even tried to write because writing is really all about the discipline of sitting down and doing it. Uh, I mean, I, have a, I literally have an idea file and I have a research file. So I go back to my little idea file and, these, and I just used to pull things out, you know, as, as um, you know, and there was, I had a little file on adoption that was kind of interesting to me. Um, and these are old, this is old stuff, so I'm not like, I, this is not the extent of my research, obviously, but these things I find interesting, I put it into the file. Um, one's from US News and the other one is from, as, as Paul Levine likes to say, when <laughs> Miami Herald used to be a newspaper. Um, so, um, so, well, he used to work there, so he can say that, so, okay. So, um, um, anyway, so, so I dig this stuff up um, and, uh, I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe the mother really doesn't know Sashi that well, uh, you know, or as well as she would like to. So I'm thinking, so, um, you know, adoption is a wonderful thing, and we most, I have I've no friends who've adopted children, and, it, and so I didn't want this to turn into a slam on adoption, and I've actually gotten letters from people, not letters, like I said, but emails from people who've adopted and they um, love the book. Um, so it hasn't turned into some sort of, um, uh, in any way, sort of a, an indictment of adoption. So let's stop the emails right there, okay? Um, so, um, but, so I updated my research on adoption. And where can things go wrong, right? Um, and I discovered this condition known as um, reactive attachment disorder. Um, and it has become a problem in international adoptions um, because um, you really don't know the history of some of these children and some of them are basically, um, uh, well, they're ignored, right? You know, they are completely ignored in their formative period of, you know, age zero to age two. Um, and that has um, severe consequences for, uh, who they become and how they relate to um, their caregiver, where, uh, whoever that might be, uh, their, including their newly, uh, their adoptive parents. They have no, no healthy bonds with their parents or their caregivers. Um, they're just neglected in these orphanages. Um, and people meaning well, of course, want to adopt these children, and, um, but a lot um, a lot happens in the brain between zero and two. Um, and some of it is irreversible, um, unfortunately. Um, so I dug kind of deeper into it. Boy, that's un completely, you can't read that. So no, sorry about that. Um, but um, I'll have to help you with that, okay? Um, but it's one of these... Um, one of these graphics that makes you think about, okay, what are all the things that you want in your precious, you know, five-year-old or six-year-old? Because that's about the time um, when the symptoms of this condition start to really manifest themselves, when they enter school and all of a sudden they're really just not getting it the way the other kids are. But it's much, much deeper than that. Um, and, you know, Check off the list of some of the, the problems here. Um, and rad children are um, uh, highly manipulative, uh, habitual lying about everything, um, seeming lack of conscience or remorse, uh, does not readily accept consequences for actions or decisions, hostile towards parents, false accusations of abuse against parents is common. Um, doesn't trust anyone or respect adults, uh, resists affection, um, 
Meaning that, I mean, it, when they, I say resist in fact, affection, it means even if the mother tries to hug the child, it will be, uh, it's, it's, it's an endless battle, basically. They want, they want no part of it. Um, plays the victim and always blames others. Um, so I thought, um, okay, that would make a very, uh, that's a serious condition and a serious situation, but it makes for a very interesting, you know, I don't write novels about the perfect family, right? I, it's just, uh, it just doesn't work that way. So, so I thought, okay, um, especially that idea of um, likes to play the victim. I thought, well, that would be very interesting to latch on to in this story about um, a, a murder case in which there may have been no victim. Um, so I figured, okay, great. I've got Sashi figured out for a while, which is a, it's a huge milestone when you're you know, in the creative process, when you've got, okay, something, you've latched onto something interesting. So, so then the next thing is who is Sashi's mother, right? So I've got to figure that out. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so I'm like, no, I don't think so. So, but yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah, you kind of well, right? This is sort of like that that 2 a.m. you know punchy you know kind of stage of the creative process. Um, so you know, I knew she'd be stressed. So that was like, right? I mean, here's a woman who who raised um, a rad child, um, and then her daughter vanished, uh, went through a murder trial. This, this woman is going to be, um, you know, kind of at the, on the edge of her nerves, right, at, at, at the end of it. So, um, so she also became very interesting to me as to this whole family dynamic, you know. Uh, and, you know, the, the grieving part is the interesting part because that's what, of course, Jack latches onto that. Of course a woman wants to believe her daughter is still alive, right? So uh, is that enough for him to get involved in the case and start investigating? Or, you know, or is he going to be spending his next you know, six months or a year of his life chasing down you know, false leads that a grieving mother has um, created in her own head? So, um, so uh, but in any event, that, that's, that's the, the dynamic there is what Jack is diving into is um, uh, trying to stop this this execution. So it had all the elements is basically what I'm saying. Oh, I want to get to that first. Um, this was one I'm sharing this with you because um, there's a lot written about Rad, um, and a lot of the parents are really racked with guilt because they don't uh, they they ad adopt these children with the best of intentions, but they are way in over their head with them, um, and it can be really destructive to the family, um, especially if you have other children uh, who all of a sudden you know are afraid you know in their own house. Uh, so it's a really um, but this one I thought was interesting. It was a, an essay written by a woman in the Atlantic Monthly who says, "People tell me I have the most adorable, delicious, precocious, confident child. Some say she's the most adorable child they've ever encountered. I nod and smile and pretend to share their sentiment, but I keep my thoughts to myself. How can I explain to a stranger that at home this child is distant, elusive, emotionally closed off, and defiant? What stranger will not say?" or at least silently think, really? I don't see that. It must be you, because she's not like that with me. Um, and that kind of, you know, plays into the manipulative component of the rad child, is that they present themselves to the outside world as the model child, and at home, they are destroying the family, destroying the marriage, uh, and scaring the other kids in the, in the house. So, um, so it's a... I guess what Gone Again became about was really not, it really, I wouldn't pigeonhole it as a Jack Switek death row inmate case. It's really about a disintegrating family. Um, and Jack's struggle to find the truth in that. So, like I say, it's a lawyer who wants to find the truth, a man who might be innocent, a family who's been twice torn apart, once when they adopted this child, once when she went missing. Um, 
a victim who might not be a victim and a mother with perhaps something to hide. So um, I don't know. It makes me want to read it. <laughs> so, you know, so, so, and I had a lot of fun writing it. So um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of stop there or I'm going to scoot ahead because last night I had a presentation and they told me I gave away way too much about the story. So I'm not going to do that. I am just going to skip right past that and um, go to the fact that, of course, the book is set in Florida, like South Florida, like most of my novels are. All of the Jack Switek novels are set in South Florida. Um, does anybody know where that is? Yeah. No, well, it's near Fairchild. Yeah, it's the uh, Cocoa Plum, is the entrance to Cocoa Plum, right? Is it, that's in Ingram Park, that new park they just built right there, right? And that's the center of Cartagena Circle, which I don't know if you've ever noticed those running, those boots there that are, have you noticed that? Okay, yeah, they're there. So, um, so this is where Sashi disappeared, was in that park. Um, but Cartagena Circle, um, I'm, I'm, I bring it up only because that was my, um, the way I described it was like one of the, I think it's my favorite, the, uh, my editors, I, in fact, I know it is. She just like, you know, sort of red ink, like ha ha ha, very funny kind of thing. She, um, she loved my description of Cartagena Circle because if you've ever been, if you've ever been to Cartagena Circle on a Saturday morning, oh yeah, the bikes, right? I mean, it's like everybody, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of people on their bicycles. That's where they sort of meet and they leave from. So, um, so she just got it like the biggest kick out of this. The way I started, I just Saturday, uh, uh, Cartagena Circle on Saturdays, the circle, the meeting place for hundreds of weekend joggers and cyclists, transformed into the world's greatest concentration of bulging blobs of jelly who had absolutely no business wearing form-fitting clothing. So, so um, she just thought that was hilarious. So, so I share it with you. And um, anyway, so I, I think we have some time for some Q&A. My friend Tony in the back there, thanks for coming. So, yeah. um, Oh, you raised your hand, sir. You have a question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh God. Yeah, I feel. You know, I always feel a little, little guilty laughing at this guy's expense. But you know, I mean, he he's the one who dressed that way. You know, so what, what can you say? You know, so yeah. Well, that's a really good question. The answer is no. Um, she, what, the question was, don't you have to have a, a body before you can have a conviction? Um, you have to prove there was a murder, and then you have to prove that somebody died, right? And there's, there's a number of ways you can do that. I mean, for example, um, you might prove it by saying, okay, well, she's been gone for, um, I mean, I, I know in a real-life case, I can't remember the name of the case now, but it, that came up. And they proved that the man was dead because he called his mother every Sunday at five o'clock. And he hadn't called on Sunday at five o'clock in four years. You know, so so that was one you know, you put in evidence like that suggesting that okay, the only the only way these things would happen is if the guy is dead. Um and so um in this case I don't, I, well, I don't want to get into how they prove Sashi was dead because that's, that would be giving away too much. But it's a good question, and it, it is addressed in the book. Let me just put it that way. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Succinctly outlined this very nicely. Do you do that in the beginning of the writing process? Uh, yeah, he's, it's a question about the process, my writing process. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like I said, you know, already kind of got me, I start with that idea of, you know, the what if, Everybody knows it. Well, you know that. It's like it's the what if game. You know, anybody who's ever written anything in the way of a script knows that you, you either do it in your head or you do it in a group, you know, where you're bouncing ideas off. It's a what if, what if, what if, what if this, what if this, you know. 
Um, you know, what if the governor of Florida executed a man who was innocent? You know, what if that? You know, um, and so that's the start of it. But and then you know the next, um, you know, before I get, um, it's a balance though. You know, really because uh, you know uh, between plot and character, right? So uh, because you've got a, you know, I don't really like for my cast to be too driven by the plot because then they don't feel real, right? So I want to really think through. So there's a lot of things I know about my characters that will never make it into the book. But I want to have a full vision of who they are before I start figuring out completely every nuance of what problem they're going to get it into. So, yeah, so, yeah between this book and like Cash Landing or the, the last few books with these characters? Um, well, that's, that's an interesting question too because Cash Landing, um, even though Cash Landing was written immediately prior to Gone Again, um, it's a prequel, really. And, I'd, um, and I guess once you, you know, get up to 23, 24 novels, you start doing goofy things like writing prequels <laughs> because you just, you know, the, the linear sort of approach gets a little boring, you know, for you as a writer because, you know, you just, so, um, so Cash Landing, um, which came out in June of last year, um, explains how Jack and Andy met. Um, so that puts it before, that would put it before, um, well, that, you know, if I had written that sequentially, that book should have been written in about 2005 or something like that. So, um, but that's an also it's also a good question in the sense that when you decide to write a series, one of the fundamental decisions you got to make up decide right away is it going to be, you know, is your character going to be James Bond and young and you know good looking and a womanizer for forever, uh, you know, or is your character going to age? You know, um, and I decided, you know, right up front that, okay, Jack's got to mature. He can't be this 27-year-old lawyer at the Freedom Institute forever. So, um, so, so gone again, he is, I would say, I don't think I ever really give his exact age, but he's clearly in his 40s by this point in time where he is in his career. Um, he's starting a family. Uh, and that really has changed everything in the story. And it's also kind of interesting how your own um, life sort of impacts what people, you know, when Jack started out, of course, he was young and single, you know, and, you know, now he's starting a family. So it's so, so there are parallels in that regard, too. So anyway, okay. Um, thank you for coming. I'm going to be signing books over here at the table. And um, look for, um, I actually want to mention, I have a, the novella coming in June, so I hope you all come back for that. That's, um, well, I won't say anything about that. For, but, uh, so, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for coming. As Jim said, he'll be signing right over here. We have his books, plus all of his backlist is behind the counter. If you're watching online, give us a call. We'll get a book signed for you. Stick around. we got some live music out in the courtyard. Thank you all so much for coming this evening.